and and this is a new discovery today because of you that um, I'm going to have to start thinking about more and talking about more. I think one of the single greatest disconnects in, in baseball, especially professional baseball, what I call relief pitcher protocols. Like Montas is so innate. And, and again, intuitive. At some point, if I have a baseball in my hand, I want to see how far I can throw it. And I want to see how hard I can throw it. I mean, that's just that's just life 101. I mean, a 90 mile an hour fastball at approximately 35 degrees will go between 270 and 300 based on like the science. Well, the average major league fastball is like up to 94.1 now or something, mm -hmm. which means at 35 to 40 degrees, it's going to travel maybe 330, 340, 350. It gives you the context of what kind of range of motion is in the arm. I heard Felix Hernandez long toss, not only on a start day, I heard he long toss just about every single day of the week. Today's conversation is with Alan Jager, founder of Jager Sports and co-creator of the J-Bands. If you play baseball, if your kid plays baseball, you've seen a pair of these around the baseball field. These are crucial in today's day and age with warming up, getting ready to play catch. Today's conversation with Alan made me completely rethink how I warm up for baseball games, how I'll teach warming up, playing catch, playing long toss, and frankly, what I will look for when I go to professional games when I'm watching the players warm up themselves. A big thank you to Alan for coming on, and if you'd like to learn more about the throwing program, his mental program, you can visit jagersports.com. And on that website is the Jager Sports Mental Warrior Program, as well as the throwing manual and schedule. And if you don't have a set already, make sure to pick up a pair of J-Bands. They will completely change how you warm up for baseball games. And before we get into this episode, the sponsor of this podcast is Black Label Supplements. They are a third-party tested, athlete-approved supplement company based here in the Pacific Northwest. They are forward-looking and they're coming out with new products all the time. I personally use them for all of my supplementation, whether it's pre-workout, post-workout protein, the aminos during the workout, or creatine. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. You can use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And as always, if you or somebody you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing, a property in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, Connor Webb, the Couch GM, as I'm a mortgage broker full-time for my career. It's my job to help my clients figure out which financing option is going to be best for their needs. And it's my goal to help as many sports fans and athletes in the Pacific Northwest get into the home of their dreams. So make sure to reach out to me if you have any questions. My contact information will be in the description of this video. And with that, sit back and relax and let's get into the episode. All right, Alan, thanks for joining me on the podcast. I'm really excited to hear more of the behind the scenes on the story of the J-Bands, your throwing program that you've created, the mental side, the mental programs that you've created. So let's start a bit about your story and, and how you got into sports and how you got into baseball in the first place. Well, I mean, you know, I'm sure just like you, you know, I grew up playing baseball. I started at six years old. Uh, I'll never forget. I went to my first T-ball. You know, it's funny. The, my first tryout ever as a baseball player and I, I i don't remember a lot from you know six years old and, and and younger but i remember our tryout was we went to a park and they had us throw the ball and i looking back you know i think based on how far you threw the ball or maybe how your mechanics looked um it's sort of how they drafted you or you know whatever they did so um, yeah, so I just got into it at a young age, fell in love with it at a young age and uh, felt this kindred spirit with baseball my whole life. And um, yeah, I, I just feel like I was a baseball player in another life. It's, it's just that strong of a feeling. So yeah, and I played through um, college, went to Cal State Northridge. And um, it was actually at Cal State Northridge that sort of started me on my path, you know, as far as getting into the coaching and training side, because I went through a really challenging time there mentally. And that's what spurred my interest into the mental side of the game, because when I was in college, I mean, we're talking 1986 or 87, there really wasn't any. I mean, nowadays people just can't, they can't comprehend what things were like even 20 years ago, let alone 40 years ago, um, as far as mental training, mental games, sports psychology, mental skills. It, it Yes, there was some sports psychologists out there. Ken Ravisa was starting to get out there. Uh, Bob Rotella was getting out there. But it was really a, uh, boy, it was, so, it was just such a field that was just completely undiscovered. And, and really, to be honest with you, I've told this story many times, but when I first started, which was 1990, um, 
you know, I think people looked at you like they wanted to stay away <laughs> because they they saw you as someone that if they if you're around them, you know, they had a problem or they had an issue or it was it was sort of taboo. And mm -hmm. uh, so not only was it a really new field, but it was like a tough, tough sell. I mean, people cannot. I look at all the people that are now into the mental skills, mental training field and how widely accepted it is and normalized it is and mainstream it is. And they just, and I'm glad, I'm happy it's this way, but they just cannot comprehend what, what it was like when I started. And so, um, yeah, to that degree, I'm very in, encouraged and inspired by how, how well the mental game is received as we all know it's part of life i mean there's so much um, dedicated now to public service for mental health awareness and so many athletes and 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 not not at you know just you know people in the community that come out now and talk about mental health so clearly it's uh it's now finally a way of life um but i'd say that was really my my first start um was getting into the mental training field and i'll just kind of summarize that I, I wrote a book between 1990 and 1994 while I was actually a pitching coach at a local junior college here in in LA called uh, LA Mission Junior College. Yeah, so that's how my, I guess I really started. I, I was getting heavy into the mental training field and I was writing my book. And on the side, I started doing, you know, uh, I was coaching, but doing private lessons. And, um, and then one last piece is I studied yoga in the early 90s as well. And Started creating camps um, that revolved around mental training, mind body awareness, yoga, arm conditioning, arm strength. And then, um, you know, long toss was something that I just felt like I was just teaching what was normal, you know, what, what you would do if no one had a book, you would just stretch your arm out in a long toss. And then the J bands came in as really the last part of the, the training um menu if you will that's the, the, the training ingredient um maybe around 93 or 94 um through perry husband who is really well known for effective velocity yeah so i think in a nutshell that's sort of like the overview of, of how i got to my playing side and to the teaching side yeah so when you were in college you mentioned that the the current throwing program that's essentially what you were doing in college and that was was that somewhat the standard that was taught throughout throughout school and and baseball was that that type of throwing program and then eventually you just kind of got on to you know putting it on paper and, and putting it out there to the public connor it's a brilliant question because it helps to kind of go back to the roots of, of why i i feel like in a way i've been I don't want to call it a debate, but why I've been pounding the pavement on this idea of long toss being so crucial to throwing and to arm development and arm conditioning and injury prevention and arm strength and so on and so forth. Uh, because to me, it's very intuitive and it's very natural. And so to your question, on the one hand, yes, I think I had a, uh, a throwing partner in junior college, actually, who, well, he gave me some ideas more about the pull down part of it but i feel like to really to the the spirit of your question is that long toss is something that i feel like has been around forever because it's very intuitive meaning you know you roll out of bed and you you kind of naturally want to stretch your body right if you if you pick up a football and go outside and play catch you're not going to throw bullets you know or bbs right away you're, you're going to throw Part of it's the weight of the ball, but you're going to throw with arc mm -hmm. because your body's saying, "I want to, I want to, I want this low impact relaxation throwing, so my muscles, et cetera, tendons, ligaments can can warm up." What a concept and stretch out. So to me, long toss is so innate and and again intuitive that I didn't think it would there was anything to sell on it and and I and I didn't think there was anything that would needed to be written meaning like your question is you know was that what they were teaching and my my answer would be I don't know if really anybody taught anything as much because by not teaching anything it's what you would do naturally is you'd stretch your arm out right you mm -hmm. I think I think what we forget too is that we're just built to grow, you know, that's part of the MO of being human. So 
if I have a baseball in my hand, I'm not going to do it on day one. I'm not in shape. But at some point, if I have a baseball in my hand, I want to see how far I can throw it. And I want to see how hard I can throw it. I mean, that's just that's just life 101. And so that's why, you know, your question, even though it seems pretty straightforward, has a lot of layers to it. And it's very important that people realize that long toss is not something that's like a program that, hey, let's do it this way versus that way. You're, you're just working. I, I love this line. I use it all the time. You know, nature always wins. You're working with nature when you long toss. It's what the body wants to do. It's natural. And so I would say that it's, I don't know really exactly where it came from. I think it's just, again, more intuitive. But I will say, and I'll never forget, his name is Danny Gonzalez. And uh, he was my throwing partner my first year in junior college. And I would, we would air it out and throw it basically as far as we could. But on the way in, he was the first person I can remember saying, that as you got closer to your partner, maintain the intent of your furthest throw. And that was a new concept because normally when you come in from your throwing partner, you might guide it a little bit or aim it a little bit or, or you're just trying to get it there on a fly and not play chase. And so you might still pull down with some intent, right? It's natural. Yeah. But you may not be thinking, I'm taking 300 feet in the 280, 260, 220, 180, 110. And that to me was a huge, and now we call those pull downs and the you know, other people call them compression throws. But, but that, that to me was a, a major get because there's a, we can go into it later, but there are so many nuances to what pulling down has to do with just developing arm speed and arm strength and sinking your body. But, uh, but anyway, to, you know, I know it was a long answer for your, your question. I'll try to be shorter, but no. it's a really important question because I want people to realize that you know, there's not really a throwing program out there that, I mean, there are throwing programs that are written up. We've written them up, but the best guide by far is your instincts, your feel and allowing nature to work for you. And if you do that, you're going to find that your body wants to stretch out by throwing it higher and higher and further and further and eventually lower and lower and harder and harder. Maybe not every day, but mm -hmm. that's sort of the, the rhythm of what the body wants. Yeah. And as I asked the question, as you respond, and as I've been doing research, watching some of your videos and, you know, watching the long toss and you walking through it, it's like one of those light bulb moments, because I don't know if I was ever properly really taught about that. You know, you saying stretch out. I mean, people say that, but as you think about it more, it makes sense. Um, for example, like with myself and a lot of the people that I played baseball with, you know, we would do the, the J bands. We would do some running, some leg stuff to get warmed up and all that. And then we would start, you know, you know, light with the first few throws. And then you'd always keep it on a line. And, you know, we I wouldn't go in high school, I would stretch it out a bit more. But now it's like, you know, I'm maybe going to 90 versus and it's, you know, staying on a line instead of like what you're saying, like stretching it out, keep it low intent with the arc and really stretch it out, go, go further. And then as you get to the longer distance, when you come further in, then you keep it with, with the more intent. Um, yeah, it's just like a different way of thinking about warming up and you, you kind of ended on it saying, you know, you don't want to do that every day necessarily. How, how often would someone that's looking to get in shape for a baseball season, how often would you want to stretch it out to the, to the full length? Well, here's the cool thing. If you're a position player, you're pretty much getting straight. Now, I'm assuming this is based on someone that really has trained well and got into what we call great long toss shape to where they're like a BP pitcher. Their arm is so strong and resilient and they, it wants to throw, it wants conditioning. Um, in the case of my business partner, for instance, who is my throwing partner, ironically, at Cal State Northridge, um, Jim Batcher, when he he played many, many years in professional baseball, and he was an outfielder and voted best arm in the PCL one year. And he went out basically as far as he could every day of the season. And here's why. Because his arm was in great shape, and that's what his arm was used to training for, and it's what his arm needed every day. It wanted to stretch out because it was going to eventually throw with some high intent probably in the game, maybe in the first inning. So he wanted his arm fully stretched out. Now, maybe his pull downs were 
you know, a little bit more medium-ish and maybe toward the end based on the day before if he threw a lot or threw a lot in the game. But if I asked him right now, I'd have a feeling he'd say to me that he pretty much went out to 300 feet every day, give or take, and he pretty much pulled down with pretty normal intent every day. And like a BP pitcher, he recovered well. And he was fine the next day. And his arm needed it. That, that's the point of, of our philosophy is you get into such great shape that your arm is begging for the conditioning. It wants it. Now, maybe some days he, he went up to 250 and maybe there was a day off somewhere in there. And maybe the next day he went up to 350 because he had a huge arm. Um, but the point is this. I would say he was hovering around 300 feet every day now for a pitcher you know they have bullpens they have live games if you're a relief pitcher it's really tricky but even a starter you know every fifth sixth or seventh day you're on the mound so and we have you know lots of literature on what that looks like too but i would say that in season once the bullpens start you're pretty much looking at about three out of seven days where you're going to get a pretty full long toss in and pretty much full pull downs. And it's kind of like your start day. And then there's sort of like on a seven day cycle, at least it's like day one, sort of day three, day five, and then day eight again, which is the next start day cycle. So, or it could even just be day one and then like your midweek pen, which could be day three or four. And then your start day, which could be day seven or eight, whatever, however that works. But there's sort of three great long toss sessions. I guess if you really did the math, it might be out of eight days, considering you're having a start day, 10 day start day. Uh, but even on a, on a five day cycle, you know, it's still start day. And then I, we have our guys, we want them depending on day three, which is two days after the start. Um, so it's sort of like start day is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, pen day is Thursday, start day is Saturday. So you're kind of getting in three out of, you know, six days again or five days. Um, but that, it, it, our number one principle of our throwing program is listen to your arm. So again, it depends if you throw 95 pitches on your start day or maybe only threw 50. And that changes your whole cycle and, and your long toss sessions and your pull down sessions, of course, are affected. But I think to answer your question, the easiest way to look at this, and this is what I always try to tell pitchers to do, especially relief pitchers, is just know that you can pretty much stretch your arm out to close to its full distance. Um, obviously, based on the day before, it could change a bit, especially a relief pitcher that threw 45 pitches. But think about stretching your arm out most days. It's just, do you pull down? And if you pull down, to what degree? And I think that's the missing link. Uh, with a lot of pitchers, especially in professional baseball, where they're doing this every day. And I think they're saving their arm for the game and they're saving their arm for tomorrow or whatever. And it works the other way. You're conditioning and preparing your arm for the game. And we're, we're way too much in this risk aversion mode now, unfortunately. And so I think that, yes, it's a very tricky question, Connor, because there's so many variables. But a rule of thumb is to just always try to stretch your arm out relatively close to your off-season long toss distance. Or if you threw the day before, maybe it's 200 feet and not 300 feet, but you're, but it's not 90 feet. It's not 60 feet. It's not 120. And especially with relief pitchers, they, they tend to go out between 90 and 120 feet most days because they're saving their arm for the game. And maybe they threw the night before, but if your arm trained at 300 to 350 feet in the off-season, it just doesn't make sense to only stretch out to 90 to 120 feet. No matter what, I mean, 180 to 200 feet is nothing to it. I mean, a 90 mile an hour fastball at approximately 35 degrees will go between 270 and 300 based on like the science. Well, the average major league fastball is like up to 94.1 now or something, mm -hmm. which means at 35 to 40 degrees, it's going to travel maybe 330, 340, 350. I don't know. And it's, and I'm not saying everybody has to do that every day. And I'm, I'm not saying every 94 mile an hour pitch is going to go that far, but it gives you the context of what kind of range of motion is in the arm by throwing it with some angle. And then it starts to give you that feeling of like, well, you're suffocating. And, and, the, and the way I like to say it is deconditioning. You're sucking the life. When you're doing this 90 to 120 thing every day because you're a relief pitcher, and, and the same thing happens with starters. You know, they... 
they maybe all off season they were between 250 and 350 and they're on this great long toss program and then spring training hits and all of a sudden their 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 time is monitored or, or they they threw a 35 pitch bullpen and and maybe the next day whether it's their them or the organization is saying hey we want to manage your workload you know maybe go 120 today and maybe tomorrow you go 200 where that pitcher may need 200 to 40 the next day and then the next day after that they may need 250 320 and they start living more in this 120 180 world and, and that seems to kind of take over unless the player is really either a veteran or really um well trained to where they know we've had players for instance 18 years old go into the draft that are extremely educated and in tune where they're going to know how to stay with this mentality. But you could have a college senior who knows his stuff really well, get into an organization that's maybe really conservative. And before you know it, he's really fallen into that kind of mentality. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the, the, and the differences between programs, all 30 teams, you know, like you, you just mentioned, if someone get super stretched out, they go to a conservative team. Now on the field, why are they underperforming? You know? And and then they get traded to another team. And then all of a sudden they're back to, you know, what their ceiling could be. But that might just be because they let that guy do what they needed to do and what their body's already used to. I'm a, I'm up there with the Mariners all the time and I'm watching pregame. And I think there's only one pitcher that I re recognize that absolutely launches the ball pregame to stretch out and that's Bryce Miller mm. and he's going like from the line throwing it you know across the way hitting the wall basically where the bullpen is and he's like you know doing his thing like just balanced and yanking it down I'm like how is he doing that on a game day but it makes total sense to stretch out and you, and you start slow and you go with the arc and it's really stretching it instead of like what I'm describing what I do like now it's like too high of intent too soon and it's more muscular instead of like stretching out the ligaments and all that. So yeah, I could see how, how those differences really, and it really does depend. And then like you mentioned the relief pitcher that's throwing 40 pitches in a day. I need to, I'll watch with more intent for sure as we head into next season and then also in spring training and I'll see, and I'll ask guys more about their throwing programs and, and what they do. That's really interesting. Yeah, what you could do, which is really fascinating, because this is, I'm a hawk. When I go to games, I mean, people want to go watch the game, and I do too. But one of my favorite things to do is to get there for pregame and watch the starting pitchers throwing mm -hmm. program. Um, unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, I'm sure um, there's, well, I'll put it this way. In my experience, not that I've seen it a lot on the pro side, but generally speaking, when I go to a field early um, or talk to really pitchers, more talking. I, I don't have a lot of data now based on the last five years of what major league organizations are doing relief pitcher wise. But my historically, it is 90 to 120, 150. You'll see, usually you'll see a couple guys, maybe get 200, 250. For whatever reason, it seems to either be the Latin guys or the Japanese guys. They're the ones that they feel like their culture, especially the Dominican culture, is, uh, boy, you, you just talked about a culture raised on on a lot of throwing and a lot of distance throwing. You know, people like Pedro Martinez, going back even to Mario Soto, Joaquin Andohar. I mean, I feel like that long toss is just part of that culture. And in Japan, as we know, whether it's long toss or just a lot of throwing, right, that's part of their culture. And so, um, you know, when you watch a pregame, <laughs> it really saddens me, to be honest with you. I, I feel like, uh, I don't know what the numbers are. I would assume the turnover of pitchers uh, in professional baseball, uh, the attrition rate has got to be incredibly high, is my guess. I don't know any of this factually, but I feel like I, I was talking, on, ironically, the other day to someone with the Mariners about this topic, not because of what the Mariners were doing. I was just, he's an old friend of mine. I was just blowing off steam. But the Mariners, ironically, that we're talking about the Mariners, they're absolutely one of the best. Uh, I know Max Wiener's not there anymore, but uh, between he and Andy McKay, they're just two of the, 
you know, best I know in baseball on the throwing or pitching side. And uh, so I, I was blown off steam to him about this whole idea of just how um, I think one of the single greatest disconnects in, in baseball, especially professional baseball, bar none uh, on, on the physical side is, is the relief, what I call relief pitcher protocols. I think that we have it's so ambiguous. I, I, I feel like there's maybe not a lot of context from the past. Um, I think guys are doing what they've been doing for 100 years, uh, or maybe not 100 years, maybe 20 years. Maybe if they were doing it like 100 years ago, they'd be doing it more like we're talking about, which is more feel. Um, yeah, it saddens me because I just feel like that um, same with starting pitchers. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, like you said, you're going to see Bryce Miller's. You're going to see guys that that absolutely i heard felix hernandez long toss um, not only on a start day i i heard he long tossed just about every single day of the week uh, not that he pulled down many of the days but he got out to 300 feet almost every day um you know what a shock uh, a latin pitcher but um but i do feel like that's one of our greatest disconnects by far is that we we are in what's called workload management mode right now and there's a lot of data and metrics and there's a lot of control a human being is not a robot we want to condition we want to train I was talking to ryan croton about this yesterday he's a genius and he has a website called uh, arm i think it's called armcare.com and he's worked with major league organizations he's a biomechanic uh, guy and we were just talking all about this idea of feel and conditioning and, and endurance building and Randy Sullivan, I'll quote him, he talks a lot about robustness. You know, this is called training and development, and we're in this other world now. We've been there for probably the last five to 10 years, which is this risk aversion and workload management. Um, yeah, some of that stuff can be helpful, um, but I went on a little tangent here. But, but back to your point, start asking pitchers, and, and, and I bet you this, I mean, we'll see what comes out of it, but I bet you this, that a lot of the guys are going to say, well, not really sure why, as a, especially the relief pitcher, they're going to say, well, I, 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 no one really told me anything, or if they did, it's just, you know, I might pitch tonight, and so I need to kind of save my arm. I would assure you that most relief pitchers are not going to really tell you how or where they got their routine from, maybe passed down. Um, relief pitchers, different animals, because I think they have more autonomy. Um, but then again, relief pitchers may have come out of Vanderbilt throwing a certain way. And then the organization may have put their stamp on what their pregame looks like from a throwing program point of view from a five day to a seven day. And then their stamp on a five day cycle versus a seven day cycle. So now, even though that pitcher's in the big leagues, that throwing routine may be way more influenced by what happened in professional baseball than what happened when they were drafted. I'll tell you what's what's really common that I see up there is the football being tossed around. When I'm up there, the bullpen guys will go out first and the starting pitchers also, and they'll be tossing the football around to get their shoulder warmed up. And then, yeah, now that I'm really thinking about it, like none of those guys are maybe 120 as the max, but you see a lot of darts also. It's like they're ripping down. So they have that warm up there. And then sometimes they'll go to the bullpen before the game and then they have to warm up in the game it's like a ton of throwing, but yeah, not much long toss there. And, you know, as we talk about the strain on relief pitchers, there's the whole, you know, hundred pitch limit for starting pitchers. What are your thoughts on pitch limits, all that stuff? You see a guy like Paul Skeens who comes into the league the first year and he's sitting a hundred miles an hour at pitch a hundred. I mean, he could, he could go 200. What, what do you think about some of the limitations that are put on the game right now? Well, I'm evolving with the times because I used to say that my stock answer used to be if you let these players train the way they could train and condition the way they condition, you wouldn't have to worry about pitch counts um, or worry much about them because they'd be able to, it's sort of like the 300 feet every day analogy of just that's what you're conditioned to do. The problem now is that there's this new term out there called workload management so if you're managing how much throwing the pitcher's doing between starts well what you're doing in my opinion is you're deconditioning the arm 
Well, now the arm is not in a position to handle higher intent workload. So now the pitch count, count is almost necessary. And then here's another issue. Unlike 10 years ago, definitely 20 years ago, definitely 50 years ago, all this high intent throwing, right? All of this um, spin rate and all these metrics that are getting guys to, you know, throw with a lot of high intent to work on their vertical break, right? Or work on their mm -hmm. spin axis or whatever. It's right. Now you've got guys is kind of what you were saying earlier. Guys are throwing more, more firmly and darts and higher intent. And, and it's like the, it's, it's sort of the double-edged sword going the wrong direction. It's a perfect storm. On the one hand, we want way more conditioning, way more endurance building and much better recovery as a result of it. So you can absorb the blow, recover well, and then stay in a conditioning mode. And now it's like they're doing the opposite. They're managing the workload. There's way more high intent throwing than there used to be. And so now where I used to say, well, the, you wouldn't really need it. Now, unfortunately, I have to say, yeah, you have to have these limits because these guys are just throwing, they're, they're not being, in my opinion, they're not conditioning as well as they could, nearly as well as they could. And they're just making way too many high intent throws. So it's a, it's a necessary evil in a way. Maybe evil is not the right word. It's just a necessary part of, of the, the programming that's going on. But that still doesn't satisfy me for the relief pitchers because the relief pitchers, it's one thing when you can control the environment with a starter and just say you're going between 85 and 105 pitches. And then you're even if you're workload managing them during the week, at least you can say that they're positioned to where they know they're not going to be throwing more than 85 to 105 pitches. Mm -hmm. um, but this does not apply to the relief pitchers. The, the monitoring of the relief pitchers, uh, it may not be monitoring anymore of relief pitchers. It just might be passed down from so many years of how they did it. But uh, but unfortunately, to answer your question, Connor, it's a uh, it's a necessary byproduct of the culture we've created. And I do not like it one bit. I, I, not the pitch count part, uh, the throwing culture. This is what I was venting to my buddy with the Mariners the other day. My, the culture, and I'm not alone, believe me. There are so many people on the training and development side that are extremely exasperated. And, not, and, and that doesn't include just people outside of this like myself or you know, or Ben Brewster or Ron Wolf. I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I'm just saying this is, I don't, the, the, the types of people that are outside of professional baseball that are able to train their players all off season long. And again, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to say that they're saying this, but I'm just saying symbolically the people that are outside of professional baseball that are doing the training and conditioning. Um, and the people inside of professional baseball that maybe are getting overtaken by the, the analytics and maybe even by the medical. There is a lot of exasperation, a ton of it, and um, and it's sad because I feel like we've um, the baseball world is is really going the wrong direction right now from a health and injury prevention point of view. And that's what everybody's talking about, and we absolutely are not doing it the right way right now. The thought behind it ultimately is what what gets guys the paycheck is more strikeouts, and to get more strikeouts, you get more velo more movement on the pitches, more spin rate. So guys are really going after those metrics to be able to make their ball do a crazy thing to try to get guys out versus like in the olden days to where, you know, I mean, they were still throwing velocity, but it's not the same. It's like whatever was natural for their body, they would do versus now it's like they're trying to make the ball do a certain thing. So now they're shifting stuff and doing stuff that isn't necessarily natural, which might be leading to some of those injuries that we're seeing kind of getting out of present day and a little bit back to your story and how, you know, the J bands came to be, you got into, you know, you were in college, you went, got into coaching, you started to learn about the mental side and start to put some of that stuff on paper and, and coach at what point did the J bands come to be? And, you know, walk me through some of the process of starting a company in sports and the entire entrepreneur's side of it too. The j is such a fascinating story to me because it just was like one of those accidental happenstance moments. Um, I think 
fortunately, getting into yoga in a funny kind of way prepared me better because when I played, this is going to sound funny because it's not really a gimmick, but I wasn't into like gadgets and things and, and, and I wish I was more open-minded, but I was very competitive and it was sort of like, give me the ball and I just wanted to compete. And, and I worked very hard and I was a preparation guy and I was a reps guy. So don't get me wrong. I was really into all that, but I just wasn't so much into, you know, I remember I was pitching in the, the Jayhawk league and um, one of the coaches there was, it's funny, this is probably just after Job's started getting popularized in the, in this, you know, maybe the eighties. And he had a tennis can filled with sand and he wanted us to do some maybe pre and post stuff. And I just, I look back thinking about how big I'm in arm care now. <laughs> I look back thinking to myself, I don't want to, the sand and this, and these movements, and he was probably doing a lot of good, you know, internal, external rotator, rotator cuff stuff. And um, he was way ahead of his time. Uh, and I kind of rejected it. I mean, I, not, not, not a rude way. I just sort of, I don't think I did it. Um, I tried it a little bit. So uh, when I met Perry Husband, who I'm sure anybody listening to this knows of his name, but if you don't, Perry is the founder of, of EV, Effective Velocity. You hear them talk about it on the MLB. Carlos Pena, who uh, worked with Perry for a long time, talks about it a lot on the MLB network. And Perry's just done a lot of things in baseball, but uh, he was actually a hitting guy. But uh, he he actually, as a position player with the Twins, he had an he had something happen to his arm. And Perry's an extremely smart guy. And when his arm was hurting, he back you know this is the mid '80s. You know he feared the worst, like his career could be over. And it really scared him. And so he got with some PTs, and they showed him some exercises. They used tubing. And his arm never felt better in his life. And so even though Harry, Harry was a pitching guy or a hitting guy, <clears throat> he made a, he made a he had a profound experience and revelation about band work. And so he started selling bands as part of an arm care program. But the funny thing is, is a lot of the way the bands were set up is he had it also um, a contraption for like not overstriding as a hitter. So they kind of connect to your ankles. And in a way, he was doing perfect reception stuff. I mean, Perry is just a genius, amazing. So long story short is we met through a, a common player that we both trained. And we I went out to watch him pitch in, out in Palmdale, which is an hour from here where Perry lives. And Perry and I met at the game. We started talking. He started telling me about the bands. And I think because I was into yoga and the idea of elasticity and, and, and I don't know, it just felt... Right, but the, the gizmo part of me, the gadget part of me, maybe was not so <laughs> sold on it, but I don't know, something about Perry and his passion and it, it, it made sense. And so honestly, it's as simple as that. Um, they weren't even called J-bands at that point. Perry had a name from, they were called Weisolators. And so I started having Perry make them. He made them by hand. He bought the tubing separately. He bought the carabiner separately. He bought the Velcro wrist, uh, wrist cuff separately, and he just made a concoction at home. And so I would literally start ordering, like, if I had a private lesson, I'd order a few. And I think whatever he cost them to make is what I sold them to my private lessons. I think it was like 25 bucks or something like that. Then I started, we started doing camps, and so I might order 20. But I was literally just, it's nickel and dime in it. And then finally, after about three years, um, we started ordering more and more. When I say more and more, this is still pre-internet. You know, this is the mid '90s, so it wasn't. But it was enough to where Perry making them by hand. He he started getting a little bit fatigued. <laughs> of, sure. You know, instead of me ordering, let's say, 50 a year, maybe I was ordering 150 or 200, whatever whatever the numbers were. We had made an agreement where we sort of took over the manufacturing. But believe me, Jim and I, my partner, we laugh, we, we, we joke about this a lot, where there was a time when we, to get a price break from the manufacturer, we had to order like, I want to say 100 J-bands at once. And when they came into our office, and we didn't have a lot of money, we were just starting out. <laughs> we were both thinking like, God, we hope we, we, we sell these. 
you know, like it'd be, it'd suck if like we, we sold 50 of them, the other 50 just sat there. There'd be a lot of money that we used. Yeah. And, and so that's sort of the, the origin of, of that. And fortunately, it's just amazing how the universe works, man. But fortunately, people started seeing this concept of prehab versus rehab. And I think the thing that we pushed really hard about band work is do it at the field. Do it right before you throw. It was a neat feeling for us to start seeing because you have to, it's hard, it might be hard for you to understand this because bands are so popular now. But there was a time, probably as late as even 2000, unless there were maybe like a local team, like maybe UCLA or something or some, uh, some high schools locally, I just don't think you'd see a lot of bands on a baseball field anywhere in the world. And so I feel like it feels good that we helped be part of that evolution to where, you know, bands were not something you just did if you had surgery as part of rehab, but they were part of what prevented you from having surgery. And, and as important or more important, well, they're both important is, is the bands as a precursor to throwing so that you're, you're protected and you're, you're positioned to throw in a way that you can optimize your throwing session and recover well as a result of it. And so, uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, it's kind of a wild story. It feels a lot of, th- believe it or not, it feels a lot of third person to me these days. It's sort of like, what happened? Um, <laughs> we, we just were buying some onesies at a time from Perry <laughs> and onesies turned into twosies. <laughs> yeah. That's how it starts is in a garage somewhere. And and then, you know, an idea turns into that and then it turns into a business. And now 30 years later, as you mentioned, I mean, everyone has a pair of J bands in their bag. I was talking with, with mags on the phone about you and I was like, wait, let me go check my bag. I, I mean, cause I never recognized the brand necessarily, but the bands, of course, everyone has a pair of the bands and Jager sports right on there. I was like, no way. Yeah, I guess they are. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Everyone knows the concept and is and is using them nowadays. So so before the bands were a thing, people were, were just doing the arm circles, doing some stretches, and then getting into throwing. Is that kind of was that the standard? Yeah, I mean, you might have had a few people out there in the world because of Job exercises that may have had light little dumbbell weights that might have known to do a little. Maybe it's because they had they went through rehab though. I don't know, but. You know, like this gentleman, this coach in Wichita, um, who was onto the sand in a tennis can. And, uh, but I'm trying to be as transparent as possible. I just cannot remember ever seeing bands. And I played also in a, you mentioned the adult league thing. I played in adult leagues till I was 45. Uh, I, I just, through the 90s, you know, look, I've been active at high schools and I've been going out to UCLA since 2000. You know, I've been, I've I've been out, we've done tons and tons of clinics and travel ball teams and all this. I just, uh, no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it'd be an interesting question to ask other people, but I I don't know when it started, but I would just say that you just, that's what people did is what you said is you, you, you you did some, you did some, you jogged, you did a full body stretch. You might have done some of this and some of this and some of this and some, right? And um, you might have done some arm circles. You kind of threw to get loose. I mean, you did some stretching, but I think the concept really was that, and, and let's face it, I mean, if you're smart about throwing and you do throw with arc and what we call relaxation and massage throwing, it's not as ideal as doing some kind of arm, obviously doing arm care first, but if you do it smartly, you can really warm up your arm and, you know, and maybe that's another reason why in the old days, you know, players long tossed because they didn't do as much arm care stuff. They didn't do maybe any real arm care stuff except for a little bit of stretching. I never thought about this till you, this just came up. Well then by, by nature, they weren't very loose like they are now. They didn't have that luxury. So they had to get loose and in order to get loose, they knew not, they they weren't ready to throw the ball on a line because they didn't do 30 minutes of arm care like they might do now. So they had to throw with Mm -hmm. arc because intuitively it was, it was visceral. Like 
I'm get I gotta loosen my arm up. like the old days, right? Like do this. I gotta loosen my arm up. So they probably had to throw a ton of arc and they probably had to feel their arm, what we call opening up or stretching out. And if they have a strong arm, 90 miles an hour, 300 feet, well, they probably didn't feel fully stretched out until they got close to 300 feet. And so in a way, the old system, isn't it amazing what the, it's like you talk about how old cars or old speakers are made or whatever, you know, it, it's just amazing when you, I've never thought about this in 34 years. Thank you, Connor, for, for <laughs> pulling this out. But that's another huge benefit that we had prior to all of this, even though the arm care stuff is so vital and, and, and great. It's like the internet, you know, the internet having it is such an incredible resource, but is it now affecting how our, our certain parts of our brain, the creative aspects of our brain that used to have to dig and look for stuff and figure stuff out. And, and so in a way, the old school way of getting loose because you didn't have all this arm care, you had to learn to get loose through your throwing. And not only did they have to throw further because of it, but think about the further you throw, the more you're throwing. So now you're building volume and conditioning. What a shock. There wasn't workload. I think maybe there was, I can't say for sure, but there's no such thing as workload management when you have to get your arm stretched out the right way and you have to build the conditioning to do it. That's the management. You're just yep. managing to make sure your arm is completely conditioned. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, what I was going to say is also thinking through it, it's like maybe the J-bands have replaced some of the initial, I mean, as you're describing, so the J-bands have replaced some of the initial warm-up that players needed to use. So now they think that they don't need to go and throw super far because they have done all of the bands pre, you know, beforehand. So they're more stretched out when they get into throwing. So they're more prepared for it. You know, it's the evolution of, of how things change. It's pretty wild. I'm sorry. I was yeah. going to say to your point too, which you kind of already said, is it's also why players probably un unconsciously feel comfortable going out there and throwing firmly early on. They yeah. are so hot. They are so warm. They're not really officially warmed up properly in the right way, but it's like a trick to the brain they, they feel hot and loose and they are warmed up right but they still need to stretch their arm out properly where now they have this false sense of security and, and maybe out to 120 feet if they threw with 80 percent in tennis instead of 100 percent in tennis, it, it wouldn't matter because they're 80 percent they are warmed up to handle let's call it 80 percent or whatever the number is but they're not warmed up to handle 100 percent even though it feels like they are and and, the, and, and it's it's, it's twofold. It's the freedom to throw hard earlier. And it's the misunderstanding also that even though you're super warmed up, you still need the extension and the range of motion and the distance and the volume building. Mm -hmm. And and this is a new discovery today because of you that um, I'm going to have to start thinking about more and talking about more because in a way, Connor, it's really one of the major reasons why we have arm in, higher levels of arm injury, arm injuries now more than ever, is that false sense of security. Well, maybe they're even to you know able to go 350 now, 375 because they are warm with the J bands instead of being pure cold. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see how that thought process kind of transpires over these coming weeks and months. If there's anything that changes with your conversations with people and and how, how they go about warming up. One more question before on the throwing side of it. I definitely want to get into the mental side of it as well. Yeah. When should a kid that's growing and, you know, playing baseball and playing catch, when should they start thinking of long tossing? And I assume that J bands are for all ages. Well, we, for, for J bands and any kind of arm care, we usually say around eight when they're kind of, a little more responsible and they're they're maybe more interested in baseball as opposed to they're just playing to play um but if nothing else at that age it's it's habit building and it's some basic warm-up stuff that they're very supple and they, they tend to be kind of loose and free anyway but i got this from a physical therapist real early on in, in life and she made a great point which is 
if nothing else at that young age, they start getting into a habit with light band work of just muscle balance, especially the, the back of the shoulder is going to tend to be weaker than the front. But I think a lot of it is just, just looseness, warming up range of motion, and it's habit forming. So I'd say to cover sort of the arm care area, but definitely by the time they're 10, 11, 12, and they're starting to mature, you want it to be part of the world. As far as long toss, I use a term because this question has come up a lot in the past. And when I tell parents that have kids that are eight or 11 or 13 even, is instead of worrying, maybe more of the younger kids, instead of worrying about a long toss program, it's way more important to get out and play catch consistently. And so instead of two days a week, you know, make it four to five, or at least maybe four. Maybe teach them a little bit about arc throwing as opposed to just coming out and playing line drive throwing right away. But I think really you don't need to start focusing on long toss as a, as a concept, as a as training, a training tool. Maybe around 11, 12, 13, you start focusing more on that gradual buildup of distance and you start to understand the concept of pulling down. Um, but I, I think the, your point is really more that the, the most ambiguous area is probably between 7 and, and 11 or 7 and 10. And at that, those ages, instead of thinking about long toss, just think about playing catch and, and right. stretching your arm out whatever that means, and, and just probably doing it more often than you might be doing it. Because I have i can't prove this. It seems like the players that have the most resilient and strongest arms just seem like they threw a lot growing up, whether it was baseballs, footballs, volleyballs, tennis balls, rocks. <laughs> they, they just seem to like to throw. And I can't prove this. And I'm not saying this is year round because, you know, I'm, I'm big into diversification and having kids play other sports. But, you know, I, I would just say that if you're in throwing mode, and, and especially if assuming the player is interested. Now, sometimes you have kids that aren't that, maybe they're not that interested in playing and now you're forcing them to play catch and then the, they're resenting it. But generally, if a kid's into it, get out there as often as, you know, get out there four or five days. Just play, go in the front yard, even if you only go out to 60 feet. Just play yeah. catch, play catch, play catch. And, and catch to a young kid is really fun because if they're seven years old on a baseball field, they may not see a lot of action. When you play catch, it, you're constantly engaged, right? <laughs> yeah. And if you grew up with brothers, you're probably already throwing stuff maybe at each other like you shouldn't, like myself and my brothers. But I'm sure that helped also. <laughs> we we threw everything growing up, man. We played, yeah. you know, we played World Series in front of the house, you know, pitched to each other, right? We threw oh, yeah. batting practice to each other all the time. It was, I'm convinced one of the reasons I have a resilient arm is because I threw so much growing. I loved throwing. And um, and that's why earlier I, it wasn't to paint a negative picture on what's going on in the United States. I do feel like other cultures, like I mentioned earlier, like the Latins, like the Japanese, I'm sure I'm missing up some other cultures, but it just feels like they grew up more in tune with nature, meaning there's not so much rules and programming and they they just want to go out. Like I know, especially in the Dominican, they 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 want to play, they want to throw. They're playing games all the time, every day. They're always throwing. And why is it that 12 and a half percent, I don't know what the numbers are now, but like 15 years ago, the numbers were astounding, the percentage of Dominican players in both major leagues and the minor leagues was there's there was 15 there 15 million Dominicans on the island at the time of the study it was maybe 12 14 years ago and it was like 15 percent in the minor leagues and like seven and a half in the big leagues I mean it those numbers are might be better now and I know it's one culture but I wouldn't say that because then you have I, I, the Japanese. I know, I know their culture well too. It's just, it's not ironic that these cultures that these players are coming from that they throw a lot. And we're not talking about now. Maybe nowadays it's starting to get a little bit more with metrics, and there are starting to get into the guns, you know, the radar readings. And um, but I digress. Sorry. 
<laughs> no, yeah, makes total sense. And and yeah, I mean, let the kids play. You know, let them go out and play all types of sports and throw stuff and hit stuff, and you know that all helps build into the love of the game. And it's ultimately at the end, at the end of the day, it's they're just trying to have fun, and it turns into the the long term success in baseball, like you're seeing in those other cultures. We, we have a lot to learn. I mean, we have a lot of bright people in our community. And I think the baseball people, you know, are more in alignment with this. I just feel like that with all the metric stuff out there now and all of the risk aversion stuff out there now, um, I understand it um, from a like a, a principle point of view, you know, a logic point of view, you can understand it. But it's like saying, what's the logic of what direction the wind's going to blow right now? There's no chance. You, you, yeah. you, you'll know. I don't think if you track the wind for a hundred straight years, a thousand straight years, I don't think there's going to be a trend. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe there will be. I, I doubt it. I think the wind is going to blow the whatever way it's going to blow. And so that's nature. We're, we're trying to put the win in a box. We're, pu we're putting the win in a formula. And, and the win wants to be free. That's nature. And so we need to get back to nature with training and development. We need players to do a much better job of auto-regulating and, get, and getting out of this programming. And um, it just saddens me because I feel like that this is what we did for a hundred years mm -hmm. and now we're bringing in all these ideas which normally a lot of these ideas is part of evolution and it and forwards things right like technology can really help you know with cars and airplanes and and science and surgeries right like a lot of things have gotten a lot better because of it but there's certain areas man when it comes to the art form of life you know throwing is an art form and it's like the wind. You gotta, you gotta get out of the way. Let nature do the work for you. Yeah, I feel like we went from the the natural side of it to now the super analytical and technical technical side of it. And you see that some of the the coaches that use only analytics or use it too much in their decision making are starting to get bit on stuff like. Hey, this lefty can't hit against a lefty hitter, but if that lefty is three for three on the day, you know, he's hot, he's feeling good. You don't sub in a right-handed pinch hitter for him just because of the, the handiness. It's like, I feel like at some point there's gotta be a balance and we might at some point in the near, in the near future, swing back to somewhere in the middle to utilize both of them. But yeah, the more information that we can get out about these throwing programs and how it should be, I feel like the better off people will be love all the stuff with with the throwing program let's get into the the mental side of it a bit obviously baseball is an extremely mental game both from the hitting side and the throwing side hitting a baseball is the hardest thing to do in sports which gives the pitchers the advantage but with, with your experience with dealing with the mental side of baseball back in high school you know we would sit there in the classroom kind of going through film and talking through mental stuff and everyone close your eyes and envision yourself in an at bat in the game tomorrow. And the more reps that you can get m done mentally when you're actually in that situation in the game or when you're, when you're on the mound with the bases loaded two outs, you're able to put yourself in that same spot and with the breathing as well to calm yourself and to deliver like, you know, that you can, so walk me through the, the mental side and how you started to learn about it and, and your advice on that. Yeah, well, what you were talking about is just some really good like visualiz visualization or mental rehearsal, which is very, very powerful. I would say to go back to the beginning, I basically switched my major over to psychology when I was going through my challenging times at Northridge in one of my psychology courses the professor talked uh, brought up a zen story and i didn't know what zen was and so i started diving deeply into zen and, and in a nutshell zen was pretty much like where i wanted to be as a, as a baseball player right mm -hmm. don't think react you know that's like 
a very basic version of, of, of Zen. You know, Zen is really about, you know, just going with the flow and, and trusting your instincts and trusting the, the nature. What a shock. There's that word again. Trusting the nature of things to just flow and, and kind of like get out of the way, right? The thinking is what gets us usually and distracts it. So through Zen, I got deeply into meditation. And that was the, the genesis of the book where I wanted to talk about how Zen related to sports and life. And meditation was the, the, like the engine of the car to, you know, to realize your most optimal state of mind, if you will. And so I just took that out, out into the world, you know, and just said, hey, this is um, what I want to teach and what I have found extremely helpful in my life. <clears throat> and over time, I've seen it be extremely helpful for, you know, players and people we've worked with for 34 years now. I think that in a nutshell, I try to keep it so simple now, meaning what is what is your philosophy on the field? What is your philosophy off the field? So let's just get super clear about that. We generally talk about the process, which is a very common term nowadays, but we want them to be process oriented on and off the field. Again, the driver to all of it is is the engine of the car is, is the mental practice. Now you talked about mental rehearsal, which is a great piece of it. We start more with breathing and meditation exercises to really focus first and foremost on how do you get quiet? How do you allow, how do you start to distance yourself from thoughts that are distracting you or worrying about the future or worrying about the past or worrying about who's in the stands? So meditation, that's why I call it the hub. It's your baseline and it's a practice. And the irony is if you want to get better at anything in life, going into the hole as a shortstop to your right, throwing a changeup, right? Hitting a backhand drop shot in tennis, right? 35 foot three pointers. If you're going to get better at anything in life, well, what are you going to do? You're going to practice. So to me, it's not a complicated concept, of course. It's just a trickier sell at first because everything else is very tangible. I can go to the gym right now and shoot three pointers all day. And then when I leave, I can notice that, man, especially that spot over there, I'm like eight for 10. I was like one for 10 yesterday. So in, in meditation, even though you can feel very visceral feelings and reactions to it, you know, you may not be able to quantify it exactly in that moment to a statistic unless you're maybe hooked up to electrodes and stuff, then you can see a lot of valuable data. So in a nutshell, that's the two areas that we work on with our athletes, but we make it very, very clear that as important as the process is, and it is very important, the, the kind of the strategy part, uh, we call it game management or life management. The practice is still the foundation, having the meditation practice and what goes on there and, and by the way, the breathing and getting quiet is step one. That to me is still the main step. But then you can start bringing in all sorts of fun stuff like imagery, visualization, mental rehearsal. You can get into mantras. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with meditation. Let's say it's bottom of the night, two outs, you know, you're on the mound. What would you tell a pitcher as far as breathing technique or as a way to ground themselves and to be focused and present in the moment, if you could summarize, you know, the, the top tips that someone can do in that moment to prepare for what they're going to do. So the first answer is it's going to be like the long toss. It comes back to all your preparation. So if you've done the preparation, you've done the meditation, you're in tune with your breathing, you know what it means to, to not engage your thoughts and to be present with your process, right? That's part of your default now. now I'm not saying you're gonna be perfect at it all the time, but that, that is your, in your awareness. So my advice is gonna be the same. The difference is how is someone gonna hear it? If they have historical practice behind them, right? If they've been meditating for two weeks, if they've been working on their process for two weeks, 
my advice is going to land, I think, a lot stronger more and very quickly. If someone's never done any mental practice, I'm going to give them the same advice. It's just they may revert back to the thing that's making them nervous or whatever's distracting them, right? Mm -hmm. So right. the advice is that someone, it's, it can give me any scenario, it's going to be the same. Literally, you can pick seventh game of the World Series, bases loaded, and you can tell me it's an inner squad game today. I'm going to give you the exact same advice. Mm -hmm. We would have already built your process. So for me as a pitcher, it's breathe, have a focal point and attack it. As a hitter, it's breathe, see the ball well, hit it hard. Okay, so I have my process in place. So once the situation comes up, if I start thinking about the situation and now I'm starting to get anxious about it or worrying about it, the advice I'd give myself, which I'm playing it out as if I'm giving it to somebody else would be, oh, space is loaded, that's a thought. Seventh game of the World Series. That's a thought. Let me get back to neutral. Let me get quiet. Let me get to my breathing. Okay, where's my process? Breathe. See the ball well. Hit it hard. Done. Mm -hmm. You can apply that. You could tell me about a first job meeting. You could tell me about speaking at a conference. You could tell me about going on your first date. It's all going to come back to the same infrastructure which is and, and a lot of the infrastructure has to do with what have you done the last day or two month or two year or two decade or two to position yourself to where this is your default as opposed to yeah but it's bases loaded and if this guy gets a hit or if i if i don't do this or oh i just noticed two gyms at the game today or it's my draft year it's not my draft year it's a practice game it's not a practice game if I do well, I'm a starter. If I don't do well, I'm not a starter. So the thoughts can be, you can have a trillion different thoughts. I call those variables about a situation. Right now, we could do a trillion. It might take a little bit of time, but we could do a trillion <laughs> variables right now. Let's say a million. It makes it a little more comprehensible. We can do a million variables right now on anything, the weather. I mean, we could literally come up with a million different reasons why we could be distracted or stressed or worried or future or past. Or we could pick three constants, so variables, constants. We can pick, pick three constants that we've agreed on ahead of time are the keys for me to execute a plan that's going to position me to have the best outcome possible. Now, what sounds better to you? Three controllable constants that you've agreed. They're yours, not mine, by the way. You've told me ahead of time. If I breathe, have a focal point, and attack my spot, I'll be the best pitcher I can be. I still might give up a, a you know, a broken bat single. I still might miss my spot because I'm maybe I'm not, you know, Cy Young. But so that's the beauty of like the the mental approach is that you get to a point where you simplify it down to your constants. And then you start getting better and better at realizing that if any variables come up, they're just that. They're variables, they're distractors, they're interrupters, they're potential stressors. They're what I call drama, they're drama. Your process is not drama, your process is very straightforward. Breathe, focal point attack. The drama is, yeah, but there's a scout that stands. Yeah, but it's the ninth inning and if we win, we're world champions. We're state champions. We're league champions. We won our inner squad today, so we don't have to run as much. You see what I'm saying? It's it's all the same. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I know in the brain, one feels more important than the other. We can argue on some level it is, but at the end of the day, when you're in the process, none of it matters. You don't, it doesn't matter. What matters is what do I need to do to execute my plan? So that I'm in the best position possible to excel at my plan. I love it. Yeah, makes a ton of a ton of sense, and I definitely relate to that. It's like you can think something and make it as big as big as you want in your head, but ultimately, like you're in that moment, it's time to perform. Breathe, focal point, execute. Like just you know, exhale and start. It's like when I had my first big interview with a player. It's like okay, I could build this up or it's time to go. Like, just do it. Stop thinking you are the expert. You have trained and you've gotten to this point. It's like, just 
trust yourself and your ability and, you know, execute. I love that. Well, you did it. Your, in, your instincts took over and said, do I want to focus on what's out of my control and build this up and cause drama? Right. Those are thoughts. Mm -hmm. Or do I want to go with my instinct, which is to stay focused on the present moment. I can control that, so to speak. I am prepared. And now I'm going to trust the process. And that's more of an instinct. That's not a thought. It, it's like at some point when you get in the box, you're, you're in instinct mode. You have to just mm -hmm. see the ball and, and do your thing. So you did it, which is cool. You figured out a way to get to your process and stay out of the drama. And like when you're hitting a 100 mile an hour fastball, you have like less than a tenth of a second. That's instinct. You can't even think about it. You just got to swing. It's a good metaphor of life, you know, to trust. Right. That's why it's funny. We've had certain themes keep coming up. That's why I keep saying nature always wins. You know, we're trying to, you know, give you the analogy of the, of the, of the analytics. We're trying to create an analytic for that one tenth of a second. And we all know it at the end of the day, you can put the analytics in ahead of time and maybe get that into your, you know, your neural pathways, if you will. But at some point, it's a, it's got to be 100% instinct because that's the only way you're going to be able to hit a ball is with your instinctive movements. So that's a nutshell of, of like going back to the stuff I'm throwing. It's like we need to get back to the the instinct. And uh, and so you did it, man. It's, it, it's, it's cool. It's cool to hear that story because you applied to me like really deep principles to – putting yourself in a position to excel. And I guarantee you, you had a really good first discussion with that person because you were into your process. Speaking of long toss, it was actually Bryce Miller. <laughs> well, I, I want to meet Bryce Miller because I feel like uh, anybody that uh, inspires me to hear about someone that um, is, is, really of the ilk of what we believe again it doesn't mean every single person has to do it this way but it's just it's really nice to hear about someone and and i still and believe me even though i'm talking a lot about the 90 to 120 pitchers you know believe me there's still plenty of guys out there that you know if you watch them pregame especially starting pitchers you'll see them long cross uh, it is. and in fact in spring training and i think it was seattle um i was at one of the games and one of the pitchers that was backing up, he was a starter, but he was coming in innings like three and four. And I didn't know that at the time, but I think I got his name and followed him. He was, I don't know if it was 350, man, he was launching it and I was like going, and then sure enough, he came in half an hour later in the third inning. So he was getting his pregame in. Anyway, it, uh, no, there, there's, there's plenty, look, there's, not only are there plenty of guys out there that like the long toss, there's plenty of coaches in professional baseball that are into it. And so it's just this thing going on right now with the freedom to long toss and the, the, the not risk aversion and the analytics. And the, there's a lot of money now at stake. A lot of these guys are making a ton of money. So now it's almost like, a tight, maybe a little bit of the kick glove syndrome, you know, let's not let them get hurt. Um, right. That's more risk aversion stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I do believe that uh, I have a saying, which is the truth always prevails. And I do feel like that nature always wins. And so it is going to come back to nature. It's just a shame. I don't want to say it's a shame. It just saddens me that we have to take this side trip where I feel like it's going to, it's going to cause, cause a lot of unnecessary injuries, not just in professional baseball across the board. And there's a lot of kids, unfortunately, that have dreams of getting a college scholarship, uh, just playing in high school. How about that? Getting a chance to get drafted, getting a chance to get to the big leagues. And it's just, it's very sad right now that we're on a track where a lot of kids, it's not going to be their fault either. They're, they're just sort of following what's, what's trending. And, 
yeah, it's very, very sad to me that part. But I'm I'm encouraged that it'll, as you said earlier, it'll it'll come back. And I think when it comes back, I actually think it's going to come back way more than 50 percent. It's going to start coming with that. The analytics, I feel like, are going to start to be used more as like a, a supplement. I think right now they're, right. they're almost like center stage. And I feel like what's going to happen is they're going to, it's going to come to a point where they're going to be a supplement. The natural part of this, the field part is going to be like 80 to 90 percent of it. Um, at least that's what I hope. And I hope that happens sooner than later. Yeah, I agree. Alan, really appreciate your time. If you're watching this, make sure to check out jagersports.com. They have a few different programs. They also have all the products on there. There's the mental warrior program. There's the return to throwing manual and schedule. Go check those out again. Really appreciate your time and hope to see you at spring training. We could stand on the sidelines and watch some guys long toss. <laughs> Well, listen, man, I really appreciate you having me on. I love your passion. I can tell you're really in tune with this. And um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I look forward to, uh, you know, sharing this with, um, you know, people in our orbit as well. And um, uh, again, just want to thank you for taking the time and having me on.